Good morning, everyone. Thanks for showing up in such great numbers. That's uh, always a good thing for uh, such an early uh, session. <laughs> and um, uh, first of all, I would like to ask you a question. Um, I mean, or let, let's start like that. Uh, last night I had um, um, a, a weird uh, encounter with a, a locked door. Um, out of... Uh, The, the fate that we endured uh, during this week, we were out of our apartment um, and uh, the hotel owner let us stay in their office. But the guy who stayed there uh, put the deadlock on, so we tried to reach him. Hmm, how do you reach them? Um, we thought about, hmm, maybe he has some messaging, maybe he has some um, uh, mobile number. No, landline, landline, they have landline. Um, It turned out th that uh, the guy was not at the landline uh, uh, out uh, exit, and so uh, we looked around in the bar. So this uh, wouldn't have happened if uh, he had mobile messaging. So to dive into that, if we could just text him, hey, we are at the hotel, please open the door, um, we uh, would have had one hour more sleep tonight. Um, so let's dive in um, with... Uh, Yeah, uh, the talk of today. Uh, so this morning session uh, starts with our speakers uh, Roland Schilling and Frieda Steinmetz. Um, and they will be talking about, um, they will at first give you a gentle introduction into mobile messaging. Um, I have nine messaging apps on my phone, no, ten. Uh, the organizers forced me to install uh, another messaging app. Um, and after that, give you a quick analysis, or not so quick, I don't know, a deep analysis uh, of uh, the Threema protocol. So, let's give another round of applause for our speakers. Thank you, Thilo. I'm Roland, this is Frida, and as Well, as Thilo already introduced us, um, we are going to talk about secure messaging. More specifically, we are trying to give a very broad introduction into the topic because we want to make uh, the field that is somewhat complex available to a more broad audience um, so as to leave our expert bubble and um, get the knowledge of technology that, pe that people use every day um, to these people who are using it. So um, to do that, We have to start at a very low level, which might mean for the security and crypto nerds in the room um, that you will see a lot of things that you already know. Um, but uh, bear with us, please, since we are specifically trying, at least with the first part of the talk, to um, convey a few of these um, mechanisms that, that drive encrypted uh, messaging to people who are new to the field. So um, what we are going to try today is um, basically three things. We, are, we will try to um, outline privacy expectations when we communicate. We are going to do that by um, sketching a, a communication scenario to you guys and um, identifying what we can derive from that in expectations. We are going to find an analogy or look at an analogy that helps us map these expectations to mobile messaging. And then we are going to look at specific solutions, technical solutions, um, that make it possible to um, make mobile messaging as um, secure and give us the same privacy guarantees that one-to-one uh, -one talk would. Before, in the second part of the talk, we move on to look at a specific implementation, and it's no secret anymore that we are going to look at the specific implementation of Threema. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, you are at a party, a party in a house full of people, um, and a friend approaches you wanting to have a private conversation. Now, what do you do? You ideally would find a place at this party that is, well, private, um, and in our scenario, you find a room, maybe the bedroom of the host, where nobody is in there. Um, you enter the room, you close the door behind you, meaning you are now private, you have a one-on-one, -on -one, one-to-one session in this room in private and we are going to look at what that means. Um, first of all, the most, the most um, intuitive one is what we call confidentiality. And that means that since nobody's there in the room with you, you are absolutely sure that anything you say 
and anything your communication partner says, if you imagine Frida and me having this conversation, um, is, can only be heard by the other person. Um, if that is guaranteed, we say, we, we call this confidentiality, because um, nobody who's not intended to, to overhear any of the conversation will be able to. Um, the second part, no, the second, the second, um, the second um, claim that we make is, if you guys know each other, and again, if I had a talk with Frida, I know I've been knowing him for a long time, more than five years now, um, I know what his face looks like, I know his voice, I know that if I talk to him, I actually talk to him. Meaning, um, I know exactly who my communication partner is, and um, the same thing goes vice versa. So uh, if, this is, if this is achieved, if, if we can say, I definitely know who I'm talking to, there is no chance that somebody else switches in and poses off as Frida, um, we call this authenticity. Um, moving on. Integrity. Integrity is a bit, um, this is where the analogy falls short, uh, well, somewhat. But um, basically, if I can make sure that everything I say reaches Frida exactly the way I wanted to say it, and there is no, no messenger in between, I'm not telling a third friend, please tell Frida something, and um, he will then alter the message because he remembered it wrong or uh, has malicious intentions. Um, if I can make sure that everything I say is received by Frida exactly the way I said it, then um, we have integrity on our communication channel. Okay, the next ones are two ones that are a bit um, hard to grasp at first. Therefore, we are going to take a few minutes to look at these, um, and they are forward and future secrecy. Suppose somebody entered the room while we had our talk, and um, that person would stay a while, overhear some portion of our talk. Um, and then they would leave the room again. Now, if, they, if at the point where they entered the room, they wouldn't learn anything about the conversation that we had before, which is intuitive in this scenario, which that's why we chose it. They enter the room, and everything they can overhear is only the portion of the talk that takes place while they are in the room. They don't learn anything about what we said before, meaning um, we have what we call forward security. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, and after they left, they wouldn't be able to overhear anything, anything more that we say. This is what we call future security. Because those are a bit hard to understand, um, we have made a graphic here. And we are going to get back to this graphic when we translate this, so um, I'm going to take a minute to, to introduce it. We have a timeline that is blue, it goes from left to right, and on this timeline we have a green bar that denotes our secret, con our secret conversation. The first pink bar there is when the third person enters the room, then our secret conversation turns orange because it's no longer secret. It's now overheard by the third person, and after they left, um, they wouldn't know anything that was said after that. So um, the left part of it, meaning the, 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 the fact that they can't hear anything into the past, is what we call forward security, and if they can't learn anything after they left, we call it future, sec uh, future secrecy. Sorry. Okay. Um, the last one that we're going to talk about, um, since we're trying to keep things simple, is deniability. Since we are only two people in the room and there are no witnesses, um, we achieve deniability because after we had this talk, we returned to the party and people asked us what happened. Um, I can always point to Frida, as you could to your friend, and say, he said something. Frida could always say, no, I didn't. And it would be my word against his. And um, if this is... If, you know, if, if our scenario allows for this, we have deniability because every one of us can always deny having said or not having said something. And now we are going to look at messaging. Now in messaging, um, a third player comes into the room. And this could be your provider if, you, if we talk about text messaging, like short messages that we used to send in the 90s. Um, it could be your messaging provider if you use something more sophisticated. It could be WhatsApp, for example. It could be Apple, depending on what your favorite uh, messenger is. But there is always, unless you use like federated systems, if some, some of you guys might think, but I'm using Jabber. I know, but we are looking at centralized systems right now, and in these there will always be one third party that all messages go through, whether you want it or not, and whether you're aware of it or not. Um, 
And this brings us to our second analogy, which is postal services. Now, while messaging feels like you have a private conversation with the other person, and I think everyone can relate to that, you have your phone, you see you are, you are displayed with a conversation, and it looks like only you and this other person, in my case, Frida, are having this conversation. We feel like we have a private conversation, while actually our messages go through a service provider all the time. Meaning, we are now looking something at something more akin to postal services. We, um, we prepare a message, send it off, the, the, our message provider takes the message, takes it to our intended recipient, and they can then read the message. And this, is, this, this applies to all the messages we exchange. Um, and to underline that, we're going to look at what I initially called traditional messaging, meaning text messaging, unencrypted SMS messaging. And um, as you may or may not be aware of, these messages also go through our providers, more than one provider even. Say I'm at Vodafone and Frida is with Verizon, I don't know. I would send my messages to Vodafone, they would forward them to Verizon, who would then deliver it to Frida's phone. So um, since, all, since both of our providers would know all the messages, they are unencrypted, we would have no confidentiality. They could change the messages. And these things have happened, actually. So we don't have any integrity. We don't know if the messages received are actually the ones that were sent. Um, we also have no authentication, because phone numbers are very weak for authenticating people. They are managed by our providers. They, don't, they, they are not fixed. They, they are, there's no fixed mapping to our phones or our SIM cards. They can be changed. They can be rerouted. So we don't. We never know if the messages we send are actually received by the people we intended to. No authenticity and uh, no authentication. Um, now, forward secrecy and future secrecy don't even apply because we have no secrecy. Um, we do have some sort of deniability, but this goes into like philosophical, philosophic, philosophical. Let's do that again. Philosophical claims. Um, of whether uh, when I say I haven't sent anything, this must have been the provider, they can technically um, you know, guarantee they did or did not do something. So let's not dive too deeply into that um, discussion, but we can summarize that messaging translates, at least traditional messaging translates very badly to our privacy expectations when we think of a communication. Okay, <clears throat> um, moving on. Looking at our postal analogy, actually our messages are more like postcards because they are plain. Um, our providers can look at them, can change them, you know, all the things we've just described, just as we, just as they would a postcard. They can see the intended, uh, the intended uh, recipient. They can look at the sender. They can look at the text, change it, postcards. And what we want to achieve now is um, find a way to wrap these postcards and make them more like letters, assuming that postal services don't open letters. That's the one, the one point with this analogy that we have to uh, like define. And um, to be able to do that, we're going to, we're trying to give you the shortest encryption to, uh, the shortest introduction to encryption, see I'm confusing myself here, um, that you will ever get, starting with symmetric encryption. Now, encryption, for those of you who don't know, um, is what we call the translation of plain readable text into text that looks like it's random, but it can be reversed and turned back into plain text, provided we have the right key for that. So um, to stick with a very simple example, please imagine this box that we've just labeled crypto, and we are not concerned with what's in the box, we just imagine it as a machine. Please imagine it as a machine that um, takes two inputs, the plain text and the key, and it produces something that we call ciphertext. The ciphertext is undistinguishable from random text, um, but it can be reversed at the recipient side using the same key and basically the same machine just doing the operation you know, in reverse, turning ciphertext back into plain text. This is what we call, sorry, this is what we call symmetric encryption because if you imagine a line um, where the ciphertext is, you could basically mirror the thing onto the other side so it's symmetric at that, at that um, line. Um, and when, so when there's something uh, that is called symmetric, there is also something that is called asymmetric, and asymmetric encryption works relatively the same way, only there are now two keys. We have made them a yellow one and a blue one, 
These keys are called a key pair. They are mathematically linked. And the way this works now is that anything encrypted with one of these keys can only be decrypted with the other one. You can do it both ways, but um, the, the important thing to memorize here is just anything I encrypt with the yellow key can only be decrypted with the blue key. Okay. Since we have that now, um, let's capitalize on this, on this scenario. Imagine um, each of our communication partners now has one of these two keys, and we are still talking about the same key pair that we've outlined on the previous slide. Um, now we call one of them a secret key and one of them a public key. This is probably known to most of you, um, traditional public key cryptography. Um, we've added something that is called an identity in this, in this picture. We will get back to that in a minute. But um, the scenario we want, we want you to envision right now is that um, both parties would publish their public key to the public, and we are going to get back to what that means as well, um, and keep their secret key, as the name says, secret. Some of you might know this as um, a private key. It's the same, the same concept applies. Um, we just chose to call it a secret key. Um, because it, it, it more clearly denotes that it's actually secret and not never published. So this would mean any message that would, that would be um, encrypted with one of the party's public key could then only be decrypted with that party's secret key, putting us in a position where, we, where I could um, take Frida's public key, encrypt my message, send it to him, and I would know that he would be the only one able to decrypt the message as long as he, his um, secret key remains his, well, secret. And he, he doesn't, um, doesn't publish it. Um, well, the problem is, this is a very, um, well, the problem is it's a very expensive scenario. We get um, something akin to a, postal, to a postal service where we can now um, encrypt the message and envision it like um, putting a plain sheet of paper into an envelope, seal it, we would put it on the way. Um, nobody on the line would be able to look into the letter. They would, of course, well, since there are addresses on there, they would see who it is from and who it is to, but they couldn't look inside the letter. This is achieved. Um, but as I've already said, it's a very expensive, uh, it's a very expensive mechanism, and by that we mean it is hard to do for devices, especially since you are doing uh, mobile messaging on your phones, ideally. Um, especially hard to do on, on small devices like phones. Um, so what if we had a mechanism that uh, would allow us to combine symmetric and asymmetric encryption? And it turns out we do. And um, we are going to keep this very simple by just looking at what is called key establishment and then again also just one particular way of key establishment. Um, we have two new boxes here. They are called key generators. And the, the scheme that we're looking at right now works, works the following way. You can take one of the secret keys and another, par and another public key, like the one of the other party, put them into the key generator. And remember, these keys are mathematically linked. Each secret key belongs to exactly one public key. And the way this key generator works is that through this mathematical, this mathematical linking, um, it doesn't matter if you take, in this case, let's call them Alice and Bob, if you take Alice's secret key and Bob's public key, or um, Bob's secret key and Alice's public key, you would always come up with the same key. And we call this a shared key. Because this key can now be, it can be generated independently on both sides, and it can then be used for symmetric encryption. <coughs> and as we've already told you, symmetric encryption is a lot cheaper than asymmetric encryption. Um, so this has one advantage and one disadvantage. The advantage, I've already said, is that it's way cheaper. And um, the fact, well, the advantage is also that we come up with a key on both sides. And the disadvantage is that we come up with one key on both sides. Because um, whether or not you've realized this by now, um, since this is a very static scheme, we, we always come up with the same key. That is going to be a problem in a minute. So let's recap. Um, we have looked at asymmetric encryption, which, um, as I've said, gives us IDs, and we're going to look at what that means, but it is very expensive. We know that symmetric encryption is cheap, but we have to find a way to get this key 
delivered to both parties before they can even start um, uh, encrypting their communication. Um, and we have looked at key establishment, which um, allows us, which gives us symmetric keys based on asymmetric key pairs. Um, meaning we have now basically um, achieved confidentiality. We can use these keys, put them in the machines with our plain text, get cipher text, can, you know, we are able to transport it to the other side. Um, nobody can look inside. Confidentiality is achieved. Um, now, deniability. Deniability in this scenario would basically mean, if you think back at our, our um, initial sketch where we could say, I haven't said that, and the other guy couldn't prove that we did, um, would in this case be a letter that was sent to both of the participants, and it would be from either of the participants. So that when looking at this cryptographically, we couldn't say, this was sent by me or this was sent by Frida. You could just see it was sent by, well, either of us. And if you think of um, the scheme that we've just sketched, since both parties come up with the same key by using different, um, by using a different set of um, keys to, to generate them, um, basically the same key can be generated on both sides. And you can never really say by just looking at a message if it was encrypted with a shared key generated on one or on the other side, since they are the same. So very simply and uh, on a very high level, we have now achieved deniability. What about forward and future secrecy? You remember this picture? Our overheard conversation on the party that we were at at the beginning of the talk? Well, um, this picture now changes to this. And um, what we are looking at now is something we call key compromise and key rene renegotiation. Key compromise would be um, the scenario where one of our keys were lost. And we are talking about the shared key that we generated now which um, if, it, if it would fall into the hands of an attacker, this attacker would be able to decrypt our messages because it's the, the same key that we used for that. Now, if, if, if at the point where the key was compromised, they wouldn't be able to decrypt anything prior to that point, we would have forward secrecy. And if we had a way to renegotiate keys, and they would be different, completely different, not linked to the ones we had before, um, and then use that in the future, we would have future secrecy, but we don't. Since, um, as we've already said, the keys that we generate are always the same. And we want you to keep this in mind, um, because we will get back to this when we look at Threema in more detail. Um, Yeah, if we had a way um, to dump keys after having used them, we could achieve forward and future secrecy. Since we don't, we can't right now. Okay, next recap. Our key establishment protocol gives us confidentiality, deniability, and authenticity. We don't have forward and future secrecy. And uh, if you've uh, stuck with us, you would realize we are omitting integrity here. That is because we don't want to introduce a new concept right now, but we will get back to that. And you will see that when we look at, um, when we look at Threema, it actually does have integrity. Now, basically, you could think we fixed all the, well, we fixed everything, but you heard us talk about things like IDs, and we said we, we haven't really lost a few words about them, or lost many words about them. Um, and we are going to look at that now. And we are going to start with a quote by my very own professor. Don't worry, you don't have to read that. I'm going to do it for you. My professor says, cryptography is rarely, if ever, the solution to a security problem. Cryptography is a translation mechanism, usually converting a communication security problem into a key management problem. <laughs> and if you think of it, that this is exactly what we have now. Because I know that Frida has a private key, a secret key, I'm sorry, and a public key. He knows that I have a secret key and a public key. How does I know which one of those public keys that are in the open is actually his? How would I communicate to him what my public key is? Those of you who've used PGP, for example, in the, in the, couple, in the last uh, couple of decades know what I'm talking about. And we have the same problem everywhere where public key cryptography is used, so we also have the same problem in mobile messaging. To the rescue comes our messaging server, because since we have a central instance in between us, um, we can now query this instance. I can now tell my public key, 
uh, I can now take my public key and my identity, tell the messaging server, hey, messaging server, this is my identity. Please store it for me. So that Frida, who has some, well, some kind of information to identify me, um, can then query you, get my public key back. This, of course, um, assumes that we trust the um, mes messaging server. We may or may not do that. <laughs> But for now, um, we have a way to at least communicate our, uh, our public keys to other parties. Now, what can we use as identities here? Um, in, our, in, our, like, in our figure here, it's very simple. Alice just goes to the messaging server and says, hey, who, what's the public key for Bob? And the messaging server magically knows who Bob is and what his public key is. And the same thing works, work, uh, works the other way. Um, what would... The question now is, what is a good ID in this scenario? Remember, we are on phones, so we could um, think of using phone numbers, we could think of using email addresses, we could think of something else, and the something else um, will be the interesting part, but let's look at the, at the parts one by one. Phone numbers can identify users. You remember that you rely on your providers for the mapping between phone numbers and SIM cards, so you have to trust another instance in this situation. Um, we're going to ignore that completely because we find that phone numbers are personal information, and I, for one, have my phone number, and I mean the same phone number, I've had it for like 18 years now. Um, I wouldn't want that to get into the wrong hands. And by using it to identify me as a person or, you know, the, the, uh, my, my cryptographic identity that is bound to my, to my keys. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to use that because I'm, I wouldn't be able to change it or I would want to change it if it ever got compromised. Now, um, something else comes to mind, email addresses. Email addresses basically are also personal information. They are a bit, bit shorter lived, uh, as we would argue, than phone numbers. But, um, and you can use temporary emails. You can do a lot more. You're way more flexible with emails. But ideally, we want to have something that is, that we call dedicated IDs, meaning something that identifies me only within the bounds of the service that we use. So, um, that's what we want to have. We're going to show you how this might work. But we still have to find a way to verify ownership because, uh, this is a scenario that is more or less likely to happen. I am presented with a number of public keys to an identity that I know, and I have to verify a way to, um, well, I have to find a way to verify which one is maybe the right one, maybe the one that is actually used, maybe um, Frida has used quite a number of public keys, he's a lazy guy, he uh, forgets to, you know, uh, take his keys from one machine to the other, he just, you know, buys a new laptop, sets up a new public key, bam, he has two. Which one am I supposed to, read, to use right now? Now, remember that we are um, looking at the messenger server for you know, key brokerage. And we are now going to um, add a third line here, and that is this one. Um, basically, we introduce a way to meet in person. And again, PGP veterans will know what I'm talking about. And verify our keys independently. We've chosen QR codes here. Freema uses QR codes. Many other messengers um, do as well. And we want to like tell you why this is an important feature um, to be able to, to verify our public keys independently of the messaging server. Because once we did that, we no longer have to trust the messaging server to tell us or to, we don't have longer, we no longer have to trust his promise that this is actually the key we are looking for. We have verified that independently. Okay. We have basically solved our authenticity problem. Um, we know that we can identify users by phone numbers and emails, and you remember our queries to the server for Bob. We can still use phone numbers for that if we want to. We can use emails for that if we want to. We don't have to. We can use our IDs anonymously, but we have a way to verify them um, independently. The remaining problem is users changing their IDs. That is where we have to verify again, and we'll also get back to that later. But um, I want to look at something else first, and that is the handling of metadata. Now, we know that an attacker can, can no longer look inside our messages. They can, however, still see the addressee, who the message is from, and they can see how large the message is. They can, see, they can look at timestamps and stuff like that. And since we are getting a bit tight on the clock, I'm going to uh, try to accelerate this a bit. Um, metadata handling. We want to conceal now who a message is from, who a message is to. 
And we are doing this by taking the envelope that we've just um, generated, wrapping it into a third envelope, and then sending that to the messenger server first. And the messenger server gets a lot of envelopes. Um, they are all just addressed to the messenger server, so anyone on the network would basically see there's, there's one party sending a lot of messages to the messenger server. Maybe there are a lot of parties, but they couldn't look at, um, they couldn't look at the end-to-end, -end, as we call it, channel, seeing what the addresses on each internal envelope are. The messaging server, however, can. They would open the, um, they would open the other, the outer envelope, look at the inside, see, okay, this is a message directed at Alice. Um, wrap it into another envelope that would just say, this is a message from the messaging server and it is directed to Alice. Um, who would then be able to, you know, open the outer envelope, open the inner envelope, see this is actually a message from Bob. And what we have thereby achieved is um, a two-layer two end-to-end communication tunnel, as we call it, where um, the purple and the blue bar are encrypted channels between both communication partners and the messaging server, and they carry an encrypted tunnel between both partners, you know, both uh, communication partners directly. But, and we've, we've had this caveat before, the messaging server still knows both communication partners, they still know the times that the messages were sent at, and they also know the size of the message. But we can do something against that. And we, what we do is introduce padding, meaning um, in the inner envelope, we just stick a bunch of extra pages so the envelope looks a bit thicker. And we do that by just appending random information to the actual message before we encrypt it. So anything looking at the encrypted message would just see a large message. And of course, that should be random information every time. It should, have, should never have the same length twice. But if we can achieve that, we can at least conceal the size of the message. Now, so much for our gentle introduction to mobile messaging. And um, for those, those of you who stuck around, um, we are now moving on to analyze Threema. Now, I want to say a few things before we do that. We are not affiliated with Threema. We don't, we are not here to recommend the, the, um, the app to you or the service. Um, we didn't do any kind of formal analysis. There will be no guarantees. We will, we will not be quoted with um, saying use it or don't use it. What we want to do is make more people aware of the mechanisms that are in use. And we have chosen basically a random um, message provider. We could have chosen anyone. And we chose Threema for the fact that they do offer dedicated IDs, that, that they don't bind keys to phone numbers, which many messengers do. Those of you who use WhatsApp know what I'm talking about. Um, and, well, since it is closed source, we found it interesting to look at what is actually happening inside the app and make that publicly aware. Now, we are not the only ones who have done this. We are also not the first ones who have done this, and we don't claim we are. Um, but we are here now, and we want to try to um, make you aware of the inner workings of the app, of the app as far as we have understood it. And with that, I hand the presenter over to Frida. Thank and we'll you. We'll dive right um, into that. Well, so I'll be. Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll be presenting to you our understanding of. Uh, the Threema protocol and how the application works, as we deduced from mostly um, reverse engineering the Android app. And so this won't be a complete picture, but it will, it will be a picture presenting to you the most essential features and how the protocol works. And I'll start by uh, giving you a bird's eye look at uh, the overall architecture. and. Um, while Roland was giving you this abstract uh, introduction to mobile messaging, there was also always this uh, third party, this messaging provider. And this now uh, became actually three entities, because uh, Threema has three different servers, mostly, um, doing, well, very, very different stuff for, for uh, the apps working. And I'll start uh, with uh, the directory server in, in orange uh, at the bottom. Um, because that is the server you most likely will be contacti contacting um, 
first if you uh, want to engage in any conversation with someone you never talked to before. Because this is the server that handles all the identity, public key related stuff that Roland was uh, talking about so much. Um, this is the server you'll be querying for whose public key. Uh, I have this stream ID, what's the corresponding public key, for example, and stuff like that. Um, above that, there is uh, the messaging server, which is kind of the core uh, central entity in this, this whole scenario because its uh, task is uh, relaying messages from one communication partner to another. And above that, we have the media server, and I'll be talking about that later. Um, in short, its, its task, its purpose is uh, storing large media files like images and videos you send to your communication partners. But uh, as I said, I'll, I'll uh, want to start with the directory server. And in the case of Threema, uh, this directory server is, um, offers an REST API. So uh, uh, communication with this server happens uh, via HTTP. It is uh, HTTPS, actually. So it's TLS encrypted. Um, and this encryption is also uh, uh, fulfills all the requirements you would have to, to, to a proper TLS connection. And um, so if you, if you want to communicate with a new person and you have their phone number or their email address or a Threema ID, you'll be asking, your app will be asking the directory server, hey, I have this phone number. Do you have a corresponding Threema account and public key? And uh, the response will pro hopefully be, yes, I do. That's the public key. That's the Threema ID. Go ahead. And um, as Roland said, we uh, kind of chose Threema for uh, the arbitrary use of ID, uh, IDs and especially for uh, the system of verifying fingerprints in person by scanning QR codes. And um, because this is something uh, Threema uh, has and other messengers do not have, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, because um, if you just ask the directory server, hey, I have a Threema ID, what is the corresponding public key? The Threema application will say, okay, I got an answer from, from the directory server, I have a public key, but I have very little trust that you actually know who the real person behind this Threema account is. We're not quite sure about that. So it'll mark this contact with one red dot. And if uh, you had a phone number or an email address and asked the directory server, hey, what's the corresponding Threema account and public key? Uh, the app will say, okay, we still have to trust the directory server, but we're a little bit more confident that the person on the other end is actually who you think they are because you have a phone number probably linked to a real person and you have a better idea who you're talking to. But still, uh, we rely on the Threema server. Um, so it'll mark uh, a contact like that uh, with uh, two orange dots. And then there is the final stage. If you met someone in person and scanned their, their uh, public key and Threema ID uh, in form of a QR code, um, such a contact will be marked with uh, three green dots. And uh, in that case, the app says we're 100% confident we're talking to the person we want to talk to and we have the, the, the proper keys. So right now, we're at, if, if we think of engaging a conversation, we, we're at the point where we do have all necessary details to start encrypting our communication. But question remains, how do we encrypt our communication? In case of Threema, um, Threema uses a library called SALT. It has been developed by uh, Daniel Bernstein, and he called it SALT, but it's spelled N-A-C-L. So I'm sorry for, for uh, the play on words, uh, but if you see N-A-C-L, it's uh, SALT. So um, this is a library specifically designed uh, for the encryption of, of messages, and uh, it's supposed to be very simple in use, and uh, give us all the, the, the necessary features we want. And uh, this is sort of as authenticated encryption, giving us all the features Roland was talking about in abstract before. It gives us integrity, it gives us authenticity, it gives us confidentiality. And um, just a quick look on, on how uh, this, this uh, library would be used is, um, as you can see up there, like everything in the gray box is what the library does. And we only need a, our secret key, if we want to encrypt something to someone, the recipient's public key, 
our message. So far, very obvious. And the uh, library also requires a nonce, which is something that should be only used once. That's actually yeah, part of the definition. So we generate something random and include that in the process of encrypting the message. This is just so that if we encrypt the same content, the same message twice, we do not get the same ciphertext. Um, this is not nothing secret, because as you can see at the output, um, the library actually gives us ciphertext. Roland talked a bit about that, what it is. And it will also give us a Mac. And I'll just uh, stick with a very simple definition of what that is. It is something that ensures that there is kind of a checksum. So someone getting looking at the ciphertext and the Mac can ensure no one tampered with uh, the ciphertext. So the ciphertext is still in the state uh, when it was when we sent it. And um, if we want to transmit our message now in encrypted form to someone, um, we have to include the nonce. The nonce is not secret. We can just send it along with the ciphertext. But to decrypt, we need the nonce. And well, so this is what uh, Threema uses for encryption. But as you might remember from Roland's introduction, this scheme does not offer us any forward or future secrecy. And um, we can still try to, to, to add some form of uh, forward or future secrecy to this scheme. And this is usually done, uh, sorry for skipping, um, with, a, uh, with something, something called a handshake. And uh, handshakes are a system of, of discarding old keys and agreeing, agreeing on new keys. This is usually what we do with a handshake in, in uh, scenarios like this. And um, doing a handshake with someone uh, that is not online at the moment is pretty difficult. Uh, there are protocols to do that. The signal messaging for app, uh, app for example, does something like that, but it's kind of complicated. And Threema's uh, protocol spares the effort and only does this kind of handshake with the Threema servers. Because they are always online, we can always do a handshake with them. So um, Threema has some form of forward secrecy um, on this connection to the messaging server. And how this is achieved, I'll uh, try to present to you right now. And we'll walk through this handshake step by step. And I'll try to put some focus on what every step tries to achieve. So um, if we initiate a connection, if we start sending a message, the Threema app will connect to the, to the messaging server and start the connection by sending a client hello. This is a very simple packet. It, uh, it is uh, only there to communicate the public key we from now on intend to use and a nonce prefix in this case, notice, it is, I'd say, half a nonce, and the, the other part is some, some kind of a counter that will, during the ongoing communication, always be increased by one. Um, so, but you, it'll do no harm if you just see it, a, see it as a nonce right now. Um, so we start the conversation by saying, hey, we want to uh, use a new key pair from now on, and this is our public key. Please take note. And um, the server will react by saying, OK, I need a fresh key pair as well then. Uh, generate a uh, fresh key pair. And let us know what its public key from now on is. Um, the, the, the only thing uh, to note is, um, I mean, as you can see, there is, uh, there's not much more than, than uh, the things uh, the client sent, just corresp the corresponding things from the server side. But there's also the client nonce included. So, so as we can, we can see this is actually a response to our client hello we just sent, not something that got, I don't know, redirected to us uh, on accident or whatever. And um, as you can see, the latter part of the message, including uh, the server's public key, is encrypted. That's what, what this uh, bracket uh, saying ciphertext says. And it is encrypted with the server's long-term secret key and our ephemeral temporary key. And um, by doing so, the server does something only the person in possession of the server's long-term secret key can do, and proves to us this public key we just received from the server, in, in this server hello, has actually been, been sent by the proper Threema server. No one can impersonate the Threema server at that point. Um, so um, after that, we are at a point where the client application knows this is the public key the Threema server wants to, wants to use, and it's actually the Threema server, not someone impersonating it. The server knows there is someone who wants to talk to me using this public key, 
but knows nothing else. He doesn't know who's actually talking to him. And this is going to change with the next packet, because the Threema app uh, is going to, to uh, now send a client authentication packet, we call it that way, um, which includes information about the client. The first thing is the Threema ID. Threema IDs are uh, eight character strings, it's just uppercase letters and, and uh, numbers. And what follows is a user agent string, which is not technically necessary for the protocol. It's something the Threema app sends. It includes uh, the Threema version, um, your system, Android, iOS, and your, in case of Android, the Android version, and uh, stuff like that. So it's very similar to user agent in, in web browsers. Um, yeah, I don't know why they sent it, but they do. Um, and the rest of it is nonces, Let's get, skip over them, but uh, also the client's ephemeral public key, we already sent in the client hello, but this time encrypted with our long-term secret key. So we just repeat what the server just did, proving by encrypting with our long-term key, proving that we are who we claim to be, and that we vouch that we really want to use this, this temporal key. And after that happens, each party knows what public key, what new key pair the other party wants to use from now on, and that the other party is actually who they claim to be. And so the handshake is just concluded by the server sending a bunch of zeros encrypt encrypted with the newly exchanged key pairs. This is just as the client can decrypt it, see there's a bunch of zeros, everything worked out, we have a working connection now. So if we've done that, we have this, uh, we have, if you remember this picture, we have uh, established forward secrecy in the parts between the app and the server. We do not have established uh, anything for the inner crypto layer, which is in case of Threema just taking messages, encrypting them with the salt library and sending them over the wire. There's nothing more to it. It's just, as I showed you the scheme before, used in, in a very simple way. So we now have um, channels established and we can communicate via those. And uh, in the next step, I want to look at what we're actually sending via these channels. And uh, so I'm introducing the Threema packet format. And this is um, the format packets do have that uh, your application sends to the Threema servers. This is what the, th what, uh, the Threema server sees. Um, in this case, it is uh, the form a packet has if it's something I want to send to a communication partner. For example, the content could be a text message I want to send to someone. There are different looking messages for, for management purposes, for exchanges with the server that will never be relayed to someone else. But this is the, the most basic format we use when sending images, text to, to communication partners. And as you can see, there's a packet type. Its purpose is, is kind of obvious. Um, and what follows is, is uh, the fields on the envelope, as Roland introduced, is saying, this is a message from me, from Alice to Bob, and so you recall the server can see that. What follows is a message ID. This is just a random ID generated when sending a message. Uh, follows a timestamp. So everybody, the server knows this is a recent message, has been stuck in, in transit for a long time, whatever. What follows is um, something stream, uh, Threema specific. Threema does have public nicknames. It's just an alias for, for your account. You can set that in, in the app. And um, if you do, it actually gets transmitted with every message you send. So if you change it, um, your name will change at your communication partner's phone with the first message uh, you send to them. And uh, what follows is a nonce, uh, and the non that is the nonce used to encrypt the ciphertext as follows. The ciphertext uh, you see down below is the inner envelope, as in, in Roland's earlier pictures. And we're now going to look at what is in this inner envelope. Um, what, what is, uh, how do the messages look we, we transmit to our end-to-end -to -end communication partners? And um, the most simple uh, thing we could look at is a text message. And uh, you can see grayed out uh, above still all the stuff from the outer envelope. And um, down below, it's very simple. We have a message type. It's just one byte indicating, in this case, that it is a text message. And what follows is text. There's nothing more. It's just plain, plain text. And uh, 
After that, noteworthy maybe is uh, padding. And this padding is, as you can see, in the most inner encryption layer. So the Threema server does not know how big your, your actual messages are. This is kind of useful because there's stuff uh, like typing notifications you send to, to your communication partners, which are always the same size. And uh, to, to uh, make this, uh, to, to uh, hide this from the Threema servers, we have this padding in the inner crypto layer. Um, I want to look, uh, next I want to look at a, uh, other message, message type, like, I'd say the most, yeah, I think one of the basic message types most people use with instant messaging uh, app is, is image messages. I want to send someone an image. This is something we do regularly. And um, this looks a little bit uh, weird in the first, uh, on the first look because it has a message type. We know that. We know what, it, what its purpose is. It follows a blob ID. What a blob ID is, I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, follows the size. This is very basic. It's just the size of the image just should be transmitted. And what follows is a key and the mandatory padding. So the questions are, what is this blob ID? What is the key ID? And what is this key? And um, this is where the media server comes into the picture. The media server is... Uh, yeah, well, I'll show you what happens if you uh, send an image message. Your app will take the image you want to send, generate a random key, encrypt this uh, image with this key, and send it to the media server. And the media server will say, okay, I'll store this under the following blob ID. And your app takes note of this blob ID, and then will send this kind of image message I just showed to you uh, to the messaging server, uh, via the messaging server, to your communication partner. Your communication partner opens up the message, looks at it, sees a blob ID, sees the key, and goes to the media server and says, hey, do you have a blob ID, uh, something stored under this blob ID? And the media server will respond, yes, I do. Here's the encrypted stuff. And your communication partner can take this um, encrypted stuff, decrypt it with the key you sent, and look at your image. This is how image sending works. So right now, we do have the, basic, the basics of modern instant messaging. We can send text, we can send images, this is the simple stuff. And um, what I want to look at next is something that most people uh, would want a modern messenger to have as well, and that is group conversations. Um, group conversations essentially in Threema do work not very different from other, from other method messages because um, if you send something to a group, your app will just encrypt the message several times for every communication partner involved and send it to them. But your communication partners need to, to know, well, this is a group message and it belongs to this and that group. And to do so, Threema has group packets and they include exactly that information. They include a creator ID, which is the Threema ID of the person who created the group and a group ID, which is something randomly generated when uh, creating a group. And after that follows a regular packet format, in this case a text message. If it were an image message, you would see exactly the same stuff as shown in the image message before. So this is how uh, group messages look. And um, But we need a way to introduce gr new groups, to change names, and for that uh, there are uh, special packets. And uh, this, for example, is a group uh, set members message, which uh, tells everybody there is this new group and it has the following members. As you can see here, there is only a group ID. There is no longer a group creator ID included. And that is because uh, Threema's group management is very static. There can only be one person managing a group, and that is the person who created the group. So only the person who created the group can send this kind of messages, saying there is a new member in the group, for example. And therefore, the group creator is implicit in this case. It is the sender of the message. So uh, this is kind of annoying because you, you cannot have a group where, where everybody can have members, for example, and stuff like that. Um, just uh, if you set a name for a group, the message looks very similar. It just doesn't include a member list, but a name field. So um, what I want to talk about next is 
something that happens above all the stuff I talked about right now. Because now I, I show you there are different kinds of packets doing all that stuff. There, there are lots of more packages for audio messages, for example. They look very similar to, to the image messages because they just, I mean, we have a blob ID for the audio file and stuff like that. But what is kind of interesting, I thought, we thought is, um, that above this layer of packet formats, there's, there's also some additional stuff happening. And, um, a good example for that is, uh, how Threema handles subtitles for, for, for images. You can, I think a lot of modern messengers support that, add some, some kind of text to an image. And, uh, Threema doesn't have a packet format or a field in some kind of image message for that, but they just embed, um, the, the subtitle of the image in the actual image in the active data of the image and send it along. This has the advantage of being uh, compatible with Threema versions not aware of this feature because they can just happily ignore this active data. You won't see the subtitle, but it won't break anything. It is, though, kind of wonky because it's not actually a feature which is not reflected in the actual packet format. And this is uh, also very similar happening with quotes. You can quote other people in Threema. You can, like mark a message and say, I want to quote that. And in the app, it looks like, like some kind of uh, fixed feature. Yeah? You have this message you quoted uh, included in, in your new message, and it looks like, like it's somehow linked to the old message. But in, in, in reality, it's just a text message uh, including some markdown, which if your Threema uh, version supports this, this kind of stuff, uh, is rendered nicely, as is shown below. But if your version doesn't support it, you'll just see the plain text. So again, being compatible with versions that don't have it introduces some, yeah, weird layer. And uh, with that, I'll uh, stop uh, showing you all the features Threema has. There's certainly more to talk about, but I think um, you should have an idea how how it works in, in, in uh, basic terms, what it does. All the other stuff is kind of similar to what I showed you and differs in, in, in particularities, which aren't so important, I think. And I'll just hand over to Roland, who'll be wrapping up uh, our talk and uh, say something about the results of our uh, reverse engineering. Okay, um, we told you we reversed the app and we told you we want the first ones, and this is all true. But um, we came here to tell you guys, or to make you guys aware of uh, things you can expect from messaging apps, and we hope that um, by using Threema as an example, we have, we have um, shown you how you can relate your own privacy expectations to different apps, and we also hope we gave you enough terminology and explanation to that so you can make um, a more, more competent decision next time you look at a messenger and look at what its promises are. Um, since we reversed it anyway, and we did a lot of coding to do that, um, what we did is um, put it in a library. Now, I don't know how many of you guys know the term academic code. <laughs> <laughs> we are, of course, um, we are, of course, um, working at a university, so we've been doing this on and off for, for quite some time. We started roughly two years ago, did it for a couple of days, then left it lying around, and. Eventually, we had the whole thing uh, lying in a drawer for about a year before we decided to finish it. So um, we we didn't we never actually put a lot of effort into the code. We are not proficient programmers, but we still wanted to um, we still wanted to publish what we did um, with the hopes that um, a small community might form around this, um, maybe extend it, help us you know fix the, a few things that we didn't do so well, help us document documenting it. You don't have to take photographs, by the way. We'll uh, we'll upload the slides. Um, so. These repositories, they exist. We pushed to them, uh, we, we made a, th uh, a GitHub organization that we pushed to them yesterday. 
if you wanted to look, if you wanted to start coding right away, say if you wanted to write a bot, we'd recommend you wait a few weeks, say two to three, because we still want to like fix a few of the kinks in there. Um, everyone else, we hope, um, will just look at it. Maybe this will help your understanding of what it actually does. And um, also, the activists in us hope that this might get the people at Threema to open source their code, because no matter what we tell you here, and no matter what they tell you how their, their app actually works, and this is always true for non-open source um, software, there will never be true transparency. You will never be able to prove that what runs on your phone is actually implemented the same way we've shown you. Um, with our library, um, you would have these guarantees. You can actually, you can definitely use it to write bots if you, if you ever wanted to do that. Uh, or if you just want to understand how it works, please go ahead and um, dive right into there. Um, well, with that said, we thank you for your um, attention and um, <laughs> hope it helps. Okay, thank you very much, Roland, Frieda. Um, we only have time for one question, so who has a super <laughs> eager one. question? The signal angel is signaling. Yeah, there's a <laughs> we'll couple of questions, anyway. but I will pick the best one. Uh, the best one was from Alien. Uh, could you use captions to inject malicious EXIF data into the images? What is malicious? Is my, is my, what is malicious EXIF data? Well, um, some data that probably the image passing library. Um, what we did not do was have look very particular at uh, security problems in the implementation of Threema. I could. Uh, like th and I would say this falls into this department. There's also a, a library handling the GIF displayment and stuff like that. We could have looked at, is this broken maybe? We did not. We looked at the protocol from a higher level, and, and so I cannot say anything about it. Okay, and another question was, uh, when a non-group originating user sends the group update message, what happens? Okay. Nothing. Um, Shall I answer? Yeah. The thing is, Threema group IDs aren't globally unique. A Threema group ID only refers to a particular group together with the group creator's ID. So if you send an update group message from your account, um, the app would look for a different group than you intended because your group ID would say, I'm, I'm trying to update a group created by me with this and that ID. So... Uh, it won't be the group you want to hijack. Okay, very well. Another round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>